Today on Temer IT Gens, we're joined by Corey Nakarana, who is the Chief Security Officer at WatchGuard Technologies. WatchGuard Technologies is a global leader in unified cybersecurity. The company's unified security platform is uniquely designed for MSPs to deliver world-class security that increases their business scale and velocity while also improving operational efficiency. The company's award-winning products and services span network security and intelligence, advanced endpoint protection, multi-factor authentication, and secure Wi-Fi. Corey joins us today to tell us more about WatchGuard and some of his thoughts on security trends for the next year. Thank you for coming along, Corey, and welcome to the gym. Oh, it's always a pleasure, Tom. Thank you for having us. You're very welcome. Uh, well, let's just jump straight into it. Uh, start off with an easy question. Are large language models a target for hackers in 2024? Uh, absolutely is my answer. Uh, I, by the way, I'll start with large language models are a great useful thing. We're going to find a lot of innovation and productivity for business. So don't be afraid of using machine learning. I prefer to call it machine learning. I don't think it's AI yet. But uh, whatever you want to call it, it, it has a lot of benefits and boons for society, so don't be afraid of it. But malicious threat actors are going to use it too. And this is prediction season, so depending on your questions, I, I, I'll share some of our predictions. And one of our predictions is to expect to see some prompt hacking with large language models in uh, 2024. Not sure how much you in your audience know about prompt hacking. Uh, look, bits and pieces, but you're welcome to explain it again if you'd like. Yeah, so to jump right in it, I think everyone knows a large language learning model are things like Chat GPT 3.5 and 4. Fantastic things that, frankly, they're not as smart as people think. They're just basically, if you've ever used autocomplete where you text something and it's predictively guessing what your next word is, Really, a large language model is essentially just that, but it's that on like nuclear stereo, st steroids, I should say. It's the, the extreme version of that that also has a lot of internet training data, uh, a history of all the things humans have said before to make its prediction pretty good. It's frankly, in my opinion, not that smart. It's just very predictive at guessing common things we would say. So its answers are actually probably the more common answer, not necessarily the smartest right answer. But what does this mean for attackers and how threat actors are going to use it? Well, in large language model usage, which is available even for free for a lot of people, the first thing you got to realize is when you're using these tools, you and your data may be being shared with these tools. It depends on how you use them and if you're using free ones or paid ones. But say you're using it for work, you might have to share some sensitive information about the work you're doing, maybe something private because you're trying to get the AI to tell you an answer to something. Depending on the large language model you use, that private data may become part of the training data that the large, large language model has access to. At this point, if you trust the large language model, you might be okay, but you've noticed things like ChatGP have started adding restrictions. Like they don't want you suddenly to start asking how to do crimes or how to commit the perfect murder, or they don't, uh, the companies behind them don't want them giving racist or sexist answers. So most of them have lots of different safeguards to one, prevent a large language model not to go down kind of an inappropriate avenue or criminal avenue of topic, but also because they're using data out there, both publicly available data, but sometimes private data that even the company that offers it doesn't want you to know, the, the models have safeguards between what they're supposed to tell you about what they know. Without going into all the details, prompt hacking are tricks that uh, both researchers, malicious hackers, just fun people on Reddit have figured out to kind of get past these sandboxes and, and to jailbreak the large language model. So three common techniques are prompt injection, prompt leaking, and jailbreaking. Uh, jailbreaking, you can guess, is just like if it's not supposed to talk about racist subjects, you might be able to give it an imaginary scenario. Imagine you're this, and it's not really racist, but you're this, and give me your answer in the context of this type of person. And then maybe it spits out a racist answer, uh, thus you jailbroke broke it. Prompt injection might be adding information into your prompt that thus adds to the training model of the LLM and can, can make an answer be deceptive, harmful, or misinformation. And prompt leaking is probably what most businesses have to worry about. It's if you are 
sharing sensitive data in order to get AI or a machine learning to help you, uh, you don't want that to get out. And the bad guys might have ways of tricking a machine learning algorithm into giving a little bit of its training data or, or pieces of data that even the company behind it doesn't want you to know. So that's very high level, but it all comes down to be asking questions in very tricksy ways and putting the, the large language model into imaginary situations that can sometimes get it to break some of its safeguards. So sidestepping side as much as possible, really. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I guess sort of shifting take it slightly, um, what is an attack technique that people aren't as familiar with today that will probably see more come more mainstream in 2024? Well, one thing, and it's strangely kind of related to the, the scale and automation that machine learning and even large language models offer us. And that is something we call vishing, voice phishing. So everyone knows what phishing is from a cybersecurity standpoint, and they know about spear phishing, which is really targeted, well-written emails. Vishing is the same thing, but it's as phone calls, as literal phone calls where you're talking to someone. People are probably aware of some vishing, but they may not realize of how big it's gotten. Like I, I'm sure some people have gotten microphone, Microsoft tech support calls where someone calls them and says, hey, we detected something on your computer and we're part of Microsoft. We want to help you get that thing off your computer. All you have to do is give us control of your computer so we can do whatever we want and install our real backdoor in the background. That, that's what vishing is, but it's gotten worse. And some of the things people may not realize is now they call as in the US anyways, as though they're part of your local sheriff's office. They say there's a case and you're like a, a key witness. And by the way, you didn't show up for a subpoena. So you're also in trouble. And if you don't go to this place and pay a fee, we're going to uh, put you in jail. So you better go to this uh, coin star place and buy some cryptocurrency because that's always how the sheriff's office wants you to pay. Pay. I'm being sarcastic course, here, by the way. Course. Hopefully I you mean, don't fall for that. Yeah, there's also like <laughs> the, the tax fraud angle and things like that as well, isn't there? Uh, exactly. So that's vishing. But the way we think it's going to blow up and the way you may not realize in 2024 is the one... It's actually a pretty effective technique, especially against older, less technical folks. But the one thing limiting it is it requires humans. You know, they automate their spam calls. So they're sending thousands and thousands of calls around the world to get an answer. But as soon as you pick up and answer the first prompt, they really move you to what are essentially, it's almost like the same as tech support teams of people in certain countries. But it requires humans and that slows them down. What's changing is large language models aren't just text-based, they're, they're spoken and written too. And uh, AI-generated voice, even AI-generated voice, where if, I could, if you could take 30 seconds of me talking on this podcast right now and pay $5, you could actually get me saying whatever you wanted me to say for you, literally right now today. There's tools we, that we do won't. it. We won't. We won't. Just to sure. Please don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of my security researchers already has, and he, he did it uh, saying I would give him a raise. Uh, <laughs> but the, the, the point is, to use it for. yeah. This change in large language models and this capability is going to automate this. So imagine the, the one thing holding back vishing is they have to do one human call at a time. Now they can automate the calls for voice over IP and they can automate the whole process. Once they get you on, even as a human, even if you're interacting and asking them questions, that's why they need a human before. The human was had to be smart enough to answer the, the question that you gave it. Guess what? A LLM can do that and they can fake voices very well too. So the main thing is we think that AI is going to automate the vishing process and it's it's already been bad, but it's kind of been under the radar. Now the scale of it's going to explode in 2024 and beyond. Of course. Uh, well, now obviously we're sort of shifting into the holiday period around the world, especially like Black Friday. Um, are cool tech gadgets at risk of being targeted by hackers? Oh, yeah. And I'll give you I'm a super nerd. My team gives me crap for being a VR enthusiast. I really love virtual reality. Uh, I, I don't know how much uh, you like buzz marketing, but the Quest is a very common VR headset. And by the way, the three just came out, which I, of course, very, bought day one. Good. Very yeah, it, it's a great headset. I had the Pro before, which is good too, but this is at a fraction of the price. Getting, I, I highly recommend a Quest 3 just as a nerd. 
Uh, so I think it's going to be a popular holiday item for a certain amount of people. But these VR AR headsets are adding an entirely new attack surface. And at the end of the day, they're just computers. Um, really, they're just smartphones in the case of these standalone ones. Uh, so they suffer from very similar attack profiles as a smartphone, except an increased amount of information. In order to be a VR AR device, they have cameras, depth sensors, and other things that track your whereabouts. They literally take pictures, I mean, real time of your house. They use photogrammetry or, or depth sensors to get a kind of 3D map of your house. The Quest 3 nowadays allows you to walk around in pass-through mode where you literally could map your entire house. Now, of course, uh, uh, I'm no super fan of Meta. I won't say Meta respects privacy, but the companies making these say, don't worry, everybody, we're not trying to map your house. We just happen to do this to, to perform tracking in VR. And yet the data is there. So do you know Meta and others are trying to put safeguards so that doesn't leave your headset? But the key point is it's there. The data is on the headset. It's used to track. And when there's new data like that, hackers and or researchers want to find ways to use and abuse it. And what better way to get a layout of almost every area a person goes in than to get that, that, that tracking data from your AR headset. So one of our predictions for 2024 is really around that. Some, it could just be a researcher. It may not be a malicious hacker, but someone will find mechanisms to get past the safeguards for that sensor data your VR headsets and AR headsets are using and might be able to recreate a, a 3D representation of where you actually are in physical space. Well, now I guess shifting onto something else, is there something we can use in everyday life that could expose us to threats? Oh gosh, the, the thing I hate the most that I think is Pandora's box already open. I'm gonna give you my advice knowing that almost no one is gonna take it, QR codes. Like uh, QR codes might have been around for a decade. They've been around, actually invented long ago, yeah. uh, believe it or not. But they just blew up in usage because of the pandemic for certain reasons, right? Obviously, we don't even have menus at some restaurants. Well, technically, post-ish pandemic, we you could bring back menus, you would think. But I think QR codes, we like them so much that... We don't even use menus. You go to a Fandango, a movie, and there's a QR code. You go to a movie poster, there's a QR code. You go to an advertisement with a coupon, there's a QR code. QR codes are very useful. I mean, people love pointing their phones at things and going right to a site that gives them something. Security experts hate them. As you can imagine, one of the common ways to hack you is to get you to go to a malicious link. When I send a phishing email, I might send you a link that says, uh, uh, Microsoft slash part two.com. And you might see Microsoft and hopefully you'd know that's not a good link. It's not really Microsoft.com. But if you have a QR code, that's all obfuscated. You're pointing at a thing. Uh, hopefully modern phones nowadays are at least giving you an opportunity where they pop up the domain to give you a chance to at least look at the domain. But our, our feeling in security is QR codes remove people's ability or at least habit of checking things before they go and click in on them and go to them and bad guys are going to it's it's just going to be a great new social engineering technique to get you to go to a link you shouldn't and there's already been uh, researchers and threat actors alike that have put stickers over real qr codes to get you to go to somewhere else uh, you could see people just in correspondence sending a qr code because you're so used to it and they realize you're probably less likely to check the link before you go to it so qr codes very common cool thing i actually I, like even i find them useful they're they're annoyingly useful because they're they're teaching us all bad practices as far as visiting anything we see without checking on it first anything with that sort of convenience always comes with a caveat and that, that is the absolutely uh, i think it is worth pointing that convenience and security like complexity is the antithesis of of security unfortunately it's much easier to secure simple simple yeah. than it is complex but our world is just getting more and more complex the more we add to it every, every uh, single day it is every single day uh well i guess one last question to finish off um this has been a very insightful chat so where can we learn more about WatchGuard? Well, obviously, you can come to watchguard.com. We have a fantastic site there, but it's also the home of, of blogs like our, our secplicity.com. 
I think that that's the term security and simplicity put together, secplicity, or actually .org right now, but you can find it at watchguard.com. And on that, uh, my threat researchers run a blog that we have posts and videos, but most importantly, we have our own, the 443 Security Podcast, where me and uh, you know my director of uh, the my security operations talk about all kinds of security news every week. So check out the 443 Podcast as well. So, well, it has been a pleasure having you on the journey, Corey, and learning more about WatchGuard and some of your thoughts for the coming year. Uh, but we look forward to hearing more from WatchGuard very soon. Awesome. Thank you for having me again, Tom. Okay.